Did you know that as you're aging, parts of your heart are aging, the heart destruction? I wonder if there's any spare parts that can <clears throat> help repair. Sorry, I'm bringing my love of cars into it. Dr. Edgar Tay is a cardiologist, going to be talking about that just ahead. The pump of everything, it's the main pump in your engine. And it's working non-stop, hardcore, every single day. The hardest working muscle you're probably going to have. As you age, though, uh, how can you help your heart? Are parts of it going to wear out? Could we have some spare parts that come in and tweak it and maybe service and make it a little bit better? What can be done to make over that heart? Dr. Ed Gattay is joining me, a cardiologist and interventional cardiologist at Asian Heart and Vascular Center based at Mount Elizabeth. Dr. Tay, welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, very nice to be on your show again. I remember one of the... Some couple of cardiologists came and we had a cardiology roundtable one time, and then somebody cited this example of a Japanese um, doctor who once said, like, the car, the heart has like, a fixed number of pumps, and you shouldn't exert it too much, and that's why you shouldn't exercise too much, and you should rest and have more zen life. Nobody could attribute it or find a real source for it or anything like that. But, but that was an interesting discussion. I wonder, where do you lie in terms of the aging heart? I mean, is there a finite number of beats and pumps that the heart has? Yeah, so the average number of uh, heartbeats that a person would have in his whole lifetime is about 3 billion. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if you actually uh, count that, um, um, it's actually quite scary because there's actually a finite uh, kind of yeah. time that the heart can pump. But because of this concept of uh, heartbeat being, uh, every time your heart pumps, things in the heart, the structures within the heart has to move as well. Uh, like you said earlier on, wear and tear becomes uh, an issue as we get older in, in, in life. So what is happening with our heart as we're aging exactly? Okay, so you know the heart is actually a very complex organ. We think of it very much as a pump. Mm. But in order for this pump to work, there are actually many components. So I like to tell my patients there are four major components that make up the function of the heart. The first is, of course, the pump, which is the what most people know. Mm. The second thing is that for every heartbeat that is generated, there's always an electrical impulse. So a, there is electricity in the heart as well. Mm. And then there's also the pipes or the coronary arteries that supply uh, nutrients and oxygen to the heart. And lastly, the most important part is actually the, uh, the structures within the heart. We call them heart valves. And these are the structures that actually allow the blood to circulate correctly within the heart chamber. And this is actually one of the structures that typically could wear and tear over time. So a lot of attention has to be uh, paid to all these various structures. And I, I would say that the internal structures of valves are something that uh, maybe a lot of people actually don't really know a lot about. Yeah, so out of those three, now that we've got that picture painted for us, I'm curious, how can we tie that to some of the most maybe common conditions of the aging heart faced by Singaporeans? Well, what would be your top three? And is, is it because of one of those three aspects, breaking down, wearing and tearing? Okay, so the um, top three, I would say number one would be still the coronary artery disease or yeah. blockages of the heart artery. So we've age uh, arteries uh, tend to get uh, clogged up because of our lifestyle. Um, the other common uh, condition is what we call heart failure. Over time, the heart gets uh, uh, weakened or stiffened and then patients get short of breath when they exert. And the last is because of movement of the parts of the, of the valves within the heart. Uh, patients develop what we call degenerative diseases of the valves. So the typical uh, condition would be something called aortic stenosis or one of the valves uh, uh, that guard the uh, exit of blood out of the heart, uh, where these valves tend to become stiffened and hardened over time and reduce the amount of blood flow that come out from the heart. So aortic stenosis is a classic form of degenerative heart valve disease. Gosh, so you see, like, again, going back to my car analogy, if, uh, you know, my tubes and pumps and stuff were, were not good and clean, in my mechanics would go and we'd flush things out and cleanse out the pipes and get rid of the corrosive stuff and recoat and do what we need to do. So for coronary artery disease, can I go in there and I flush out uh, whatever is clogging my way for the stenosis? Can I go in there and replace the valves? Are there spare parts for my heart? Uh, yes, uh, so I think uh, if we look at the valves, for example, uh, in the past when these valves are wear and tear, for example, the aortic valve, it becomes stiffened, does not open well. Um, in the past, there was this uh, option of replacing. So in, in, in a sense, spare parts would be replacing the heart valve. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, has now evolved over the last decade to something that is pretty complex in the past where you have to open the chest, uh, put a patient on a bypass machine and all that. But now there are much easier ways where you can put in these artificial heart valves uh, without having to go through major uh, surgery.
that is for the component of the uh, aortic valve, for example. Mm. And then, like you said, the um, coronary arteries, uh, I always tell patients prevention is still better than cure. So if you can uh, maintain a good lifestyle, then you can reduce the chance of having coronary artery disease. So low cholesterol uh, diet, healthy uh, heart diets, uh, check your blood pressure, prevent diabetes. These are important components to kind of prevent the coronary arteries from being blocked up. When you say spare parts, uh, a lot of patients ask us whether you can flush things out of the arteries. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be tough. So what we actually do is that if the arteries get choked up, we can have mechanical uh, ability to kind of open up these blockages with balloons or stands these days. Right, exactly. I mean, but we don't want it to reach that stage if possible. Uh, and that's why, like you said, prevention is better than cure. What do you think about, though, like a lot of people will say, you know, we've heard it all before. Right? Uh, eat a vegetarian-based diet and lifestyle, and it's going to cleanse your arteries. Or eat. There's always the eat this and do that. And I'm very worried about a lot of the misinformation that's out there. I know you're speaking at an upcoming event where where um, dietitians also going to be speaking, uh, rather an exercise physiologist that's going to give some insight into the exercise component component of things. Let's not leave that out. But what do you think about this this worrying, you know, misinformation that's available out there? Drink this, eat that, solve your problems. Yeah, I think there's actually um, a greater awareness that uh, lifestyle measure, measures are actually pretty important in terms of its impact on heart health. I think that is, in a sense, the public being more aware. Um, and because of that, uh, also sometimes we make mistakes by looking at websites, for example, in Google or in, uh, kind of uh, general websites, Facebook, for example, and and some of the data that is uh, purported are not uh, really uh, validated. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are some claims that uh, may not be totally true. So it's still, but, but that being said, I think in general, if you think about uh, heart healthy diets, go more towards um, a plant-based uh, diets, usually uh, recommended, less animal uh, fat would be generally uh, safe. Uh, so that is actually a pretty simple uh, uh, a guide. So more towards plant-based, less animal fat uh, would be the best kind of diet for the heart. Coming up, can a prescription of exercise really help treat your heart risk? Learning more about the aging heart on today's edition with cardiologist and interventional cardiologist Dr. Edgar Tay from the Asian Heart and Vascular Center at Mount Elizabeth. Stay tuned. <laughs> How many? 938. We're talking about what is happening with your heart and heart conditions as you age. My guest has already walked us through some of the most common heart conditions that we see in this part of the world right here in Singapore. What can we do about it? More on that as I continue my chat with Dr. Ed Cote. He's a cardiologist and interventional cardiologist at the Asian Heart and Vascular Center, Mount Elizabeth. Dr. Tay, some of the um, uh, situations that you described earlier on in terms of, you know, the spare parts. The valve replacements and, uh, and the, the, the getting rid of the arterial buildup, maybe we're using some stents or some balloons to just open up and prop up. These would only need to be, these are not being done preventatively uh, uh, in anticipation. Are they usually being done uh, when something occurs, when something happens and it becomes a bit reactionary, or can we do it in advance? Yeah, so, Daniel, this. Uh therapies are generally done when patients uh, have symptoms or we have already diagnosed the uh, the problem. I think one of the key things I want to emphasize is that uh, some of the conditions uh, like um, blockages of the heart arteries or say valve degeneration over time, the symptoms can be pretty insidious and uh, we actually find some patients present very late in the course of the disease. So I would like to kind of emphasize that uh, symptoms such as uh, exertional breathlessness or exertional chest tightness are symptoms to watch out for. So if there is some uh, relationship with symptoms to exercise, uh, then try to see a doctor early because some of these conditions when they are treated early versus when they're treated late uh, makes things a little bit more tricky when the risk becomes higher if the disease was uh, later picked up at a later stage. So I think that's an important uh, point to to emphasize. So let's let's talk about that then. We want to treat it as early as possible, get the best outcome possible, how can we do this? If the symptoms are so insidious, as you say, how can we detect early? So I think uh, one thing I would say that um, if patients are generally active, um, if you have active lifestyle in countries where the um, uh, uh, patients, uh, people are generally very uh, outdoor-like, uh, have a high amount of exercise uh, ability, uh, we find that they actually pick up these conditions a little earlier. So having an active lifestyle actually does help because 
Like a patient says, does a lot of exercise. At some point, they feel short of breath. They're more likely to pick it up than somebody who is sedentary. Uh, so having an active lifestyle is something that's useful. Second thing is, of course, just being aware. So for example, in aortic stenosis, we have patients coming late and we ask them why they didn't turn up earlier. Uh, they would attribute, uh, say, tiredness or, or shortness of breath being a condition of aging. So it's changing the kind of mindset and that, that is important. And thirdly is that um, we find that um, a lot of times, for example, heart valve disease, they can be picked up very simply uh, uh, when the doctors listen to their heart with a stethoscope. And uh, this is something we are also kind of uh, um, getting our primary care doctors to be a bit more uh, active in terms of opportunistic uh, screening of patients as well. By listening to the heart, if we hear something like a heart murmur or a normal heart sound, it can actually uh, be a sign of early valve disease as well. I wonder just off the top of my head because I happen to be sitting here and I'm looking at my wrist and we're all wearing these wearables nowadays, right? And then they're measuring all our rates and things like that. Could it be one day like like because we're so we're wearing these things that maybe technology could play a part in terms of picking up early problems with the heart? Yeah, so some of these uh, wearables are uh, useful. I think uh, nowadays they, they are watches and there are also certain uh, exercise straps that the patients can put on. Uh, most of them look, most of these look at blood pressure or pulse rate uh, irregularities. So like for example, some of the watches can pick up an irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation. Mm. And this is a especially important heart rhythm, especially as patient gets older, this is a common abnormal heart rhythm that can actually predispose patients to stroke. So picking this uh, irregular heartbeats with these wearables are actually an uh, important step and an important kind of uh, improvement in our ability to detect disease early. Picking it up early, getting better detection, uh, treating it with the right kind of prescriptions, and maybe that could include exercise as well. More on that in a moment. Dr. Elgate will be speaking at an upcoming event, by the way, uh, that is happening on the 27th of August. I'll be telling you more about that particular heart health series called Is It Time for a Makeover? Stay tuned. More coming your way in a moment. <laughs> To borrow a phrase from some of your colleagues in the medical fraternity, could could exercise be medicine? Can we prescribe exercise as part of treatment? Yes, exercise is a very, very important form of uh, preventive uh, therapy. So um, there's been studies that have been looking at patients, uh, people uh, in the communities where they are uh, participants who are very fit and those who are more sedentary, and they follow these patients up for about 10 years has been very clear in many of these studies that uh, patients who are generally fitter have almost half the risk of coronary artery disease. So half the risk of heart attacks and half the risk of uh, angina or chest pains. So it's been very clearly uh, demonstrated that in, in essence, exercise can prevent a heart disease. The only thing that I would like to caution uh, some of the listeners is that um, when a person is uh, sedentary and hasn't gone through any exercise and is thinking of actually going for a uh, an uh, exercise program, for example, uh, it's important to kind of also understand the person, personal risk uh, involved. So things like uh, uh, pre-existing heart disease, uh, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and also maybe have a brief discussion with your family physician about uh, what the risk of uh, enrolling certain exercises would be. Uh, of course, if the person doesn't have any pre-existing pre heart conditions, then generally it's pretty safe to go through a, a gradually uh, increased intensity of exercise. But those who have pre-existing uh, heart uh, conditions, we typically have to be a bit more careful. So we need to assess these patients. And sometimes we even get uh, a kind of exercise physiologists or exercise, exercise physiotherapists to kind of cater to these uh, patients uh, who may be at higher risk. In fact, some patients who have had, for example, stents or have had heart attacks, we actually put them through what is called cardiac rehabilitation. So in essence, exercise becomes a treatment for them too. Final point, just before um, I walk my listeners through some details of the upcoming event that you're going to be speaking at. Um, in terms of the long-term treatment and management of some of these conditions, a lot of um, elderly people in particular are worried about being on lifelong medications, blood thinners, uh, their warfarins, your statins, lowering blood pressure. W what are your thoughts on this? How do we, I mean, how do we try and help and address and understand the concerns of the patients who are on these medications? So I think with every therapy, we need to understand uh, this balance between risk and benefit. I think in terms of what you read sometimes on uh, on the internet, for example, they may overemphasize one or the other. So it's important to read uh, accurate sources of information and then 
balance the risk and benefit. But most times your, your physician or your doctor looking after you would be able to give you that advice. So for example, statins, uh, if the patient's cholesterol is very high, for example, and if the patient has a, a known case of, say, artery blockages, then certainly the benefits of a statin would be uh, much more advantageous compared to this minimal risk. So it's about understanding uh, risk uh, and uh, benefits for all these therapies, just like uh, procedures, for example. So if a patient has a heart valve blockage, for example, and we typically now uh, offer some patients uh, what we call TAVI or transcatheter aortic valve implantation to replace a, a damaged heart valve. And we always go through this uh, risk and benefit uh, discussion. So for example, if a patient with aortic stenosis so a narrowed heart valve um, doesn't go for surgery, for example, then the risk of uh, sudden events or the heart stopping was 50% in two years uh, versus a uh, procedural risk of say about 2%, 3%. So this, that's where you can see the clearly in, in these patients, uh, the treatment, for example, transcatheter heart valve implantation would be more advantageous than just leaving the patients alone. To learn about all this and more, you can check out Dr. Tay at an upcoming uh, seminar entitled Heart Health Series 2022, Is It Time for a Makeover? Uh, he'll be speaking on these conditions and more on Saturday, 27th of August from 2 to 4 p.m. It's happening at uh, Mount Elizabeth Novena itself. Uh, and uh, you can sign up and register for this event online right now. Dr. Tay will be speaking along with Farah Teo, who's an exercise uh, physiologist. Some of the conditions being covered include heart disease, early detection, uh, CPET testing, that's cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which I know a lot of you have worried about your elderly loved ones going through and things like that. So go check it out right now. You can sign up online just search for heart health series 2022 is it time for a makeover my thanks to dr edgar Tay, who's a cardiologist and interventional cardiologist at asian heart and vascular center mount elizabeth i'm daniel martin this has been health matters before making any decisions based on the information in our program please consult a medical professional